Welcome back to another interview episode of the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine. I'm joined today by somebody that, well, basically I already went through this before we started recording, but anybody who's listened to the show for any time knows that I have a particular penchant for one little gray computer, the Commodore 64. It's the machine that got me started in computing. It's the machine that basically got millions of people started in computing. And there's one man who's more responsible for it hitting the market the way that it did than any other. And that was a Mr. And I'm hoping I'm not killing the pronunciation of the name, uh, Jack Trammell. And I have the unbelievable pleasure today of talking with one of his sons, Leonard. Welcome to the show, Leonard. Thank you so much. And you pronounced the name correctly. Excellent. Um, well, one of my uh, co-hosts on the show had to correct me a while back because I spent years pronouncing it wrong. I'm very sorry. But I always just saw it in print. So, But yes, Tremel. So uh, I'm going to get started. Normally, I start by asking people about their education and their background of how they got into the industry, what led them there. But obviously, you are coming from a very different background because – in a way, you were born into it, if you will, if I'm under, if I understand it correctly. Well, I've been, uh, I'm the, uh, my career in the computer slash video game industry is the result of pure nepotism. <laughs> that, that is a wonderfully honest way of approaching it. <laughs> so, uh, let's, uh, we have to go back before because your educational background, which we will talk about, is fascinating in and of itself and worthy of a show. Uh, just that, that, let's face it, it's, that's a field that, you know, it's, it, it's cool. So, uh, but let's go back. So what was your earliest involvement with Commodore as a company? Um, well, besides dad working there and, you know, running the place. So I would show up when we, you know, pick him up after. Uh, at, at work to go to dinner or he would need to stop in at the office sometime when when we were there i would you know appear at the office periodically um the the first thing he would so he would occasionally bring things home and uh you know typewriters and adding machines and he brought home this electronic calculator and uh as is often the case uh, younger people have uh, less trouble because they don't have the uh, the mindset of the previous version of things. Um, I had no trouble understanding how to use a calculator. Uh, so the first time I ever did anything as sort of work with Commodore was probably when I was, I don't know, 12? Um, I went to a, a National Office Machine Dealers Association meeting, NAMDA, I believe in Chicago, and on the floor was demoing one of Commodore's early calculators. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, so it was the slogan so easy even a child can use it or? Um, no. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but that's cool. So this is at the point when Commodore is already getting into the uh, calculator business. Was this before or after they had acquired Moss? Oh, long before. Long before. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now you you talked about this. Uh, your father's giving you the calculator. You're figuring out how to use it and so forth. Uh, just from the little bit I've been able to gleam about your father's personality, and he's definitely a complex person, uh, given his, uh, life history. Uh, was there a big separation between his home life and his work? Was, uh, was work something that you heard a lot about, um, at home? Yeah, but not in a tremendous amount of detail. Okay. Uh, no, he, he would, talk about what he was doing but not not in a significant amount of detail 
Gotcha. Okay. And so you talked now about the calculator. Uh, before that, uh, did you have any direct affinity for electronics or anything like that before that, or was it just purely the the user level interaction with the calculator? So, starting in the third grade, I developed a uh, deep and abiding interest that became a lifelong passion in astronomy, and. Uh, from astronomy, it became physics and everything about how anything worked. Uh, from astronomy to radio astronomy and, and all of those things. So when it came to electronics, uh, I was I was into it because of my physics interest. Ah, okay, okay. So can I imagine you playing with uh, little electronic? kits and stuff at this point or was it more just uh trying to figure out how everyday appliances and the like work so there were very few electronic kits in existence uh this was back as my kids would say in the uh in the neolithic <laughs> um and you know electronics consisted of of hammers and chills um but he did bring home from Germany once a really fantastic electronics kit, uh, which didn't exist for very long, um, except in my room. Um, when I played with it all the time, it taught me about analog and digital electronics. I built flip flops and, um, transistor radios and all sorts of stuff out of this. Um, awesome. And I, I really learned about electronics as a result. Uh, and just to give you an idea of how young I was the first time I got interested in this, uh, he had been to Japan, came home, um, and he had a, a gift for me, which was a little transistor radio. And when I say little, it was the size of a 9-volt battery. Because that's what it was powered by, and it was scarcely larger than the battery itself. And when he turned it on, I was shocked because it was from Japan. So I expected that it would speak with a Japanese accent because all the people I knew from Japan spoke with a Japanese accent. And I didn't understand how come the, the radio didn't. <laughs> So I, I was a little kid. That's awesome. That that is perfect little kid logic. That is great. Yeah. Oh, you've talked in the past about uh, doing summer jobs at Commodore. Uh, what at what age did that start? Um, that would be in college. Oh, in college. Okay. Or or late high school. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. And what kind of tasks uh, did you engage in there? Was it more clerical or did it actually go towards your interests? Um, my first job was working in the warehouse, driving a, uh, um, a forklift and, uh, you know, moving stuff around. Uh, about as grunty grunt work as you could get in a calculator company. Gotcha. Um, I did um, for a while write a bunch of uh, calculator instruction manuals um, hmm. because I knew how they worked and could explain it pretty well. I've uh, for a long time, I was my family's um, explainer. <laughs> if you wanted to understand science because I was very interested in it, I was the person that people asked. Um, so one of the funny side effects of that is so we had these scientific calculators and I would be writing the manual, but I wouldn't actually have a calculator handy. So when using uh, when writing examples, I would have to have things like, you know, the square root of two was an example. You know, what will you do when you press two square root? What number will you see? So I have. The square root of two, the sine of 45 degrees, the square root of three, things like that, 
deeply embedded in my memory because I needed to know them <laughs> uh, for that. Oh, that's awesome. So you're telling me that the job was education. Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> ah, so, uh, now you, I guess you just answered my next question, which was whether or not, uh, your part-time jobs at Commodore overlapped with your, uh, education and your university studies. Uh, so obviously that it happened. Yeah. And, uh, did you then uh, uh, were you doing this throughout yours because you obviously did undergrad and graduate studies right so uh did you go straight through university the whole way and then come back uh to the business or were you working part time or doing any kind of work for so commodore I had, throughout yeah so i had summer jobs at commodore um one summer uh, my dad said rather brusquely that I was I was foolish to assume that there would be a job for me um, and I shouldn't count on it. So I got a summer job uh, working um, at the Ames Research Center uh, doing you know, really incredibly interesting work. I was counting craters on Mars. Oh, wow. Because, uh, you know, that's, that's really fascinating. <laughs> um, and when I started that job, of course, my father was incredibly angry. What do you mean you're not working for me? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we came to an agreement. I would work for him. Um, so the, the previous summer, I had um, well, a couple of summers previously. I, I graduated from working in the warehouse to uh, doing something which isn't done anymore, repairing calculators. So when calculators had, you know, dozens of resistors and capacitors and three or four chips, um, it, it was actually worthwhile to repair them. Uh so I learned how the calculators worked and could diagnose a calculator and figure out what chip needed to be replaced and fix them. Um, I, uh, then one, so the, the next summer when it became clear that he did in fact want me to work there, whether I asked or not, <laughs> um, he, uh, the first day in the summer, we walked into the office. He walked me to the, the back area where the engineers worked, introduced me to the guy in charge of the calculator group, said, this is my son. Make him do something useful. And he, uh, so Dotto handed me um, two documents one was the instruction set for the custom microprogrammer, microprocessor that the calculator was based on, and the software for a calculator, a simple four-function with memory calculator, and said, come back when you understand. Uh, so I went through the program and figured out how a calculator does addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Uh, which destroyed my ability to do mental arithmetic for several years. <laughs> I would literally do it the way the calculator did, um, which is nothing at all like the way people do it. Um, the next time, uh, so I, I continued working at Ames um, during the year, and uh, I mentioned to the uh, adjunct professor, I was working for that I had worked on and designed some calculators. And he said, Oh, that's great. Um, can you get me a deal? So I, I asked, I said, yes, uh, I was, I was told, yes, I, he bought a calculator. What I hadn't realized is he of course did not trust the calculator, especially since he knew the person that, you know, claimed to have, have programmed it. <laughs> So he wrote some software um, that was run on the big mainframe at Ames 
and um, check the calculator against the software uh, output from the uh, the mainframe. And they were different. And he was livid. You know, I don't care if you got me a deal. This is junk. These answers are wrong. Uh, and I and I looked, and there were a couple of numbers that I still had deeply embedded in my brain. Um, and I knew that the, the computer was wrong. And I said, oh. Um, and I looked at his code and said, oh, you forgot to put this into double precision? So the calculator is right. The computer is wrong. Uh, because you printed out more digits than uh, you guaranteed. And if looks could kill, I would be dead. <laughs> um, but he he went to the computer, you know, got one of the guys from the computer department to come, and he confirmed what I uh, what I said, and uh, he grudgingly uh, forgave me. <laughs> well, wasn't that nice of him to forgive yeah. you? <laughs> It was it was pretty funny. Oh, that's that's great. Ah, so now you so you're doing uh, this work in the summertime, right? Uh, are are you at all involved with the developments? Because obviously this is happening over several years, uh, and at some point Commodore transitions away from just doing the calculators, uh, or. Actually, I should go back here for a second. Since you were doing so much with the calculators, uh, were you aware of, like you said, the the fact that suddenly the calculators, it didn't pay off to repair them? Uh, were you aware of that change in the market when uh, the cheaper and cheaper calculators uh, started hitting? Oh, yeah. Um, so, in fact, Commodore, as far as I know, was the first to make a calculator that had only one integrated circuit in it. Um, okay. There was a, a very clever guy who figured out a way to um, make a calculator with only one chip. Uh, for a while, there had been calculators with one computation chip and a driver chip that would drive the LEDs. Um, and because of, of details about how LEDs work, um, you couldn't do both in one chip. Um, he figured out a way to overcome this problem, uh, which required doing something in the chip very different than what everyone else was doing. Um, so he knew that as soon as this calculator came out, people would disassemble it, see there was only one chip, and then open up the chip and look at the die to figure out how it worked. So in one corner, in big, bold letters, to the extent that anything's big in a single chip, it had the letters FKU, which stands for something you could probably figure out. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, so I, I was, I discussed with the guy how, how it worked and why. And I, I, yeah, I was, I was deeply aware. Um, you asked if I went straight through from college to graduate school. Um, I didn't. Uh, I started work uh, full time at Commodore a day or two after I graduated from college um, okay. and was not did not have my mind set on graduate school at the time. I thought I probably wanted to go and get a Ph.D. Uh, being a colossal nerd, uh, but I didn't. Uh, I, I worked for a year and the, uh, the drive to know more, uh, was overwhelming. So I left Commodore and went and got a PhD in physics. Uh, but that year was pivotal in Commodore. Uh, that sum, the summer I started, uh, was when Commodore bought MOS technology. Okay. And in a meeting, with the various people, you know, individual one-on-one -on -one meetings, uh, dad met Chuck Peddle and Chuck said, I want to build a personal computer. If you, if, if we can do it at Commodore, that's great. Uh, that'll be good for both of us. If you don't want to do it, I'll leave and I'll do it on my own. Uh, so 
dad came home and said, I don't understand anything what this guy was talking about. So please come and meet him. And he'll explain it to you. And you can try to explain it to me. Uh, so I had the strangest conversation ever. Uh, I, I met this guy at a trade show where he was talking about microprocessor development tools and had a pinball machine that had been developed in a couple of weeks using this microprocessor development tool called the MDT for a microprocessor development terminal. <laughs> um, and the discussion was all about a Robert Heinlein story called The Door into Summer, which is a time travel story about a future time where everything has computers embedded in it. And Chuck wanted to live in that world. He wanted to live in the world in The Door into Summer. And he realized that in order for people to accept embedded computers, they'd have to be comfortable with the idea of computers. And before... So you needed personal computers. And before you had personal computers, you needed to have inexpensive microprocessors. So he, he designed, and his group, designed the 6501, which then became the 6502, to be a very, very inexpensive yet powerful microprocessor to put us on that path. Uh, so I, I learned quite recently that the... Uh, one of the probably the, the second uh, there were of, is a very small group that designed the pet. One of the most important people besides Chuck was a guy by the name of John Fagans. And when John uh, came out to uh, Commodore to interview with Chuck, uh, Chuck dropped him off at the at his hotel. And left for the uh, hotel staff to give him a book to read so that he would know what he wanted. And that book was The Door into Summer. Wow. Um, so it was not just me that he did this <laughs> with. Uh, yeah, Chuck was obsessed by this and, and it, it showed. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, just yeah. one year, but it was an incredibly important year. And so... Now, the uh, the purchase of Moss was primarily to be able to get that chip production originally for the calculators, as far as I understood it, correct? Yeah. So MOS, <laughs> so MOS technology was one of the very few places that made calculator chips um, besides Texas Instrument. Uh, Texas Instrument, when they went into the calculator um, business themselves instead of just supplying chips, uh, destroyed the calculator industry. Um, and, uh, as my father occasionally would tell the story, uh, he wasn't ready to die. Uh, uh, he, he had this, uh, he, he would bring the fact that he was a Holocaust survivor and that it had a significant effect on his viewpoint of life, um, pretty frequently. And I, can't say I blame him. Um, it's pretty pretty obvious uh, traumatic experience, uh, but he he had a, an incredibly strong survival instinct. Uh, so he uh, found a calculator company and bought it. Sounds like the right approach. And it, um, by sheer coincidence, happened to have this processor, which he knew nothing about, and this guy Chuck Petal, who had this crazy dream based on a science fiction story well that was exemplified well by a science fiction story chuck was into computers long before he uh, knew anything about that heinlein story um and it was a dramatic turn for commodore oh, definitely so i'm guessing that you told your father that this was a good idea that he should uh back this play yep i said yep these computers, uh, they're, they're going to be big. Sweet. Now, what was the turnaround time? Did did the pet development all happen in that one year, or did it take a little bit longer to actually get the product up and running? Um, depending on what you mean by up and running, um, um, into production so that actual people were buying it, 
Yeah, about a year. Um, the first display of a, of a of a working pet was supposed to be for um, January CES of 1977, and um, it was that summer before that the the design work started, you know, full blast. So we had six months. Damn. Uh, and it, and it would have worked except for there was a, a bug on the printed circuit board. There was a, a resistor that was missing that because of the way the um, development platform worked, um, it was not obvious that that resistor was missing. Uh, so it would work when the MDT was plugged in, but not work when you had a process, when you had an actual processor. Everything else worked. Um, but it didn't make sense to show it on the floor plugged into this MDT, um, which turned out not to be too big of a deal because that CES in Chicago, um, it was like 15 degrees below zero with a windshield of 60 below or something insane Ooh. like that. And people were warned to not leave the hotel because they'd get frostbite from the wind. Oh, Jesus. Uh, so a lot of people came to the suite anyway. Um, I was, fortunately, I wasn't there for, for that one. Uh, but yeah, it, it gets cold in Chicago in the winter. Yeah. 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 It's <laughs> okay. So the, uh, the pet obviously changes the nature of Commodore. Uh, I mean, it, I'm, I, I, I know Commodore was still making all sorts of other products, including filing cabinets and so forth at this point. If, um, if, if I understand the timeline yep. correctly. Yeah. Uh, but no longer obvious, making typewriters, um, but making adding machines, calculators, digital watches, mm -hmm. um, and the pet computer. Wow. That, that that is an interesting uh it's an interesting product mix uh but i guess it makes sense because it's all all those things require certain common components at, at that right. point yeah yeah um the uh, now uh your father at this point already had a bit of a reputation for keeping uh trying to keep costs low in the production of uh the products not uh, not sacrificing quality, but uh, production costs were always a factor, uh, if I understood it correctly. So, uh, was there any? Con uh, was it hard to convince him that the pet, being the most expensive of the products, uh, was going to be a va uh, was it going to be something that he accepted that this was going to be a relatively pricey item? Or was so that an he, issue? He, well, he knew what the, what the costs of the, um, ingredients were. Um, so he knew that, um, and, be, and because Commodore through MOS technology, uh, had the, uh, a, a fantastic position on the price of one of the most expensive components, which was the processor itself, um, he was fantastic at, at making deals and negotiating prices for all the other things. So he knew that, um, no one was going to be able to undercut him. Uh, the question was, was there a market? So when the machine looked like it was actually going to be a real thing, uh, he contacted some fancy marketing research firm and said, I want to know what the market is at various prices for a machine of this uh, ability uh, with these characteristics. And they came back and said, well, that'll cost you, I don't know, a million dollars or something, and we'll give you the answer in six to nine months. Wow. And he said, um, no thanks. Uh, so the market research he did was he guessed the price based on what he knew the costs were, took out a full page ad in the New York Times, I think it was the Times, um, and said, we're making this. Here's the address to a pre-order. And 
they got in like a million dollars in checks. And he went, okay, there's a bar. <laughs> oh, it's got to say that's a baller move right there. It's just, yeah. Ah, oh, amazing. So, uh, you, I've, I've heard you tell the story that uh, you had a hand in the famous Petski. Uh, which yeah, I, was, I, I, uh, basically I designed Petski. Okay. Uh, so uh, how did that come about? Was this while, during that one year? Yeah, it was during that. Well, it was during that initial six months because Petski was, was done when the machine failed to be shown at, uh, at that CES. Um, because of the simplicity of the design, it didn't have the bitmap graphics, you know, individually addressable pixels that the Commodore 64 had. Uh, the only way to do graphics was, um, since a byte has 256 different possibilities in it, everything's done in bytes. So the number of different things, uh, bit patterns that could be shown in any 8x8 block on the screen, there were 256 of them. Um, 64 are easily taken up by numbers, letters, punctuation, things like that. Um, I was told, do the rest. Uh, so various experiments, all done with graph paper, uh, indicated uh, a, a couple of different possibilities. And there were lots of uh, trade-offs. Uh, the only thing that Chuck told me as a requirement was um, I wanted to play blackjack. He wants to play blackjack on the machine, um, mm -hmm. so it has to have the four card suits um, as built-in characters. Everything else was up to me. Oh, wow. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just the more I hear about Chuck Peddle, it's his character. Oh, uh, yeah. Quite a character. <laughs> so uh, you're developing this uh, set, and, did, and I got to ask: Did you ever consider doing lowercase letters? Um, I did not. Um, I asked Chuck about it. He said we don't need them, and that was a mistake. Uh, they were added not too long later in a subsequent version of the pet. Um, if we had considered lowercase letters uh, when the original Petsky characters were designed, uh, we would have rearranged the set so that the less important ones were eliminated when they went to lowercase um, instead of the ones that just happened to work out that way. Um, so that, that was another uh, oops, uh, but not one that uh, really significantly hurt anything. Gotcha. Uh, now, obviously, and this is a little bit of a sidetrack, Petsky uh, has a long life. It gets adopted into the Big 20, into the Commodore 64. Uh, did you expect that character set to go beyond a non-bitmapped uh, system? Was that always... Um, was that something that you even contemplated when you were making it, or was it simply a solution it for was a, sol a specific It was a problem? solution to a problem. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and were you aware, or, or did you guys feel that there might be a competitor machine coming out around the same time that might try to do a bitmap screen? Um, we knew or, it was possible. Uh, hmm. We also knew it would make it a lot more expensive. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, so it wasn't just that it was not something that was an option. It was just you were aware that it would have just made it way too expensive or yeah. more expensive. Okay. Yeah. So um, now Moss was very successful. Uh, you, you, okay, so the pet comes out. Your year at Commodore uh, ends. Right. And you go off to grad school. Now, uh, while you're at grad school, and I'm guessing three or four years at grad Seven. school? Seven. Yes. Okay. So 
Uh, do you do any work uh, for Commodore during that period, or are you purely so the, an astronomer? So the first summer, I came back and uh, had my summer job at Commodore. Um, and uh, halfway through that first year, um, I took my qualifying exams um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of a quiet, shy person. Uh, so I'm in New York City and, of course, there's nothing to do with New York City. <laughs> uh, so I'm spending most of my time in my, uh, uh, in my, quote, dorm room. And um, I had a pet. And there was a very obscure, very rare problem with the pet. It would occasionally freeze. And no one knew why. And the people working on the hardware said it was a software problem. People working on the software said it was a hardware problem. I decided I was going to beat the computer hard enough that the problem would repeat itself. And it took a while, but I managed to develop a, a fairly short program in basic that within a couple of minutes, uh, sometimes less, I got it down to about 30 seconds, uh, the computer would hang. Um, so I knew that with that tool, it would then be possible to find the problem. Uh, so I got on the phone, called John Fagans, um, and read him the program. And we agreed that if it was a software problem, it would happen the same way on his machine as it did on mine. If it was a hardware problem, it would be different. So I said, uh, and John was in charge of the software. And I said, okay, three, two, one, die. And that was the first and probably only time I've ever heard John swear. Because his computer died at exactly the same time. Oh. And wow. within an hour, he found the problem and fixed it. Uh, so that was basically the only thing that I, I did for Commodore for the next year or so. Um, I went to a consumer electronics show in Chicago a couple of years later, uh, 1980 or 81, where a demo was being given by an internal Commodore group, a uh, group being two guys, uh, where they showed a color computer, little, little tiny thing, the size of the original chiclet keyboard for the Commodore pet, um, on a, on a box that showed uh, in, uh, in glorious, uh, Petsky characters, a Starship Enterprise, but in color. Um, and that became the Vic 20. Mm. And dad said, please come to CES and tell me what you think of that. Uh, and, and I again said, this is great, but I'm sure he had lots of other people telling him about that. Yeah. Uh, but that was, that was about it. Okay. Uh, so by the time you're done then with your graduate studies, uh, what is the status of Commodore? Um, one of the uh, largest personal computer companies on the planet. Uh, they had made the Commodore 64, which was selling a million machines a month, uh, basically dominating the personal computer industry. Uh, and, uh, I was planning on going to work for Commodore. Uh, I was, I was actually very torn whether to stay in electronics, uh, or stay in, in science. I had a, uh, um, uh, an interview that I was working on scheduling to work at, at Bell Labs, go and, and, you know, do some pretty, uh, uh, pretty, pretty heady stuff. I didn't want to take the postdoc route and stay in academia, um, because that just seemed too, uh, too cutthroat. Um, and then 
at the um, January 1983, uh, sorry, 84 Consumer Electronics Show, uh, Dad quit. And um, I had the option of going from graduate student in physics to vice president of software for what I didn't know what it was going to be, but a new company to have a fresh start to make the next generation of computer. Um, so I went, okay, this is, this is an opportunity I cannot pass up. Now, obviously that, uh, CES is, well, it's, it's industry defining for a variety of reasons, but, uh, your father leaving, uh, Commodore. And that's, I guess, something that we do have to talk about briefly. Uh, you weren't there at the CS, were you? No, I was. Oh, you were. Okay. I was there. Uh, and so, uh, if you could, uh, because there have been, Obviously, a variety of different stories told about this. Um, uh, David uh, Pleasance, who was uh, later on Commodore UK head, uh, he's written a, in his book that Irving Gould told him. Irving Gould, for listeners, uh, was uh, what, what was his position? The uh, head of the board, chairman of the he, board. He was yes. chairman of the board. Board. Uh, he told him that. Uh, it was because your father had intentions or had expressed the desire to have you and your brothers join the board of Commodore. Uh, no, no truth to that at all. Okay. Uh, and the other, uh, other variations on that, uh, which probably play in a little bit because Irving Gould, according to some, uh, well, Don Greenbaum, who I've interviewed recently, uh, he he told me that Irving Gould seemed to be very, very concerned about his uh, control of the company and his ability to uh, decide what happened uh, with the funding of the company and that that also had led to Commodore being chronically undercapitalized because he refused to give up uh, to issue new equity and dilute his share. Uh and that that may have been a point of contention, but uh, Don was very clear that he said he wasn't in the room when that when whatever happened between your father and Irving happened, and he didn't want to speculate on the exact reasons for it. So well, I, 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 I wasn't in the to, room either. Yeah, but um, I I you know, had dinner with Dad um, within an hour or two. Uh, my wife actually passed him in the hall as he left Irving's um, suite mm. and dad was really upset, but didn't say anything. But what dad said was really simple. Uh, my, my father had uh, an extremely strict set of moral guidelines. Um, and one of the most important things was you don't steal. Uh, stuff that isn't yours, you can't use. So as Commodore got more and more perks, like the pet jet, as we call Commodore's private plane, um, Irving would use it as his private toy. And uh, my dad said, no, you can't do that. It's not yours. If you want to rent it from the company, fine, but you can't use it as your own thing. And as, you know, for as long as I'm president of the company, that's not going to happen. And um, Irving said, well, uh, if you don't like it, you can leave. And uh, he said, OK, I'm leaving. Uh, and you know, I, again, I was not in the room. The, the exact wording changed on different times that the story was told. Sometimes it was, as long as I'm president, you can't do this. Um, 
So you, there's a choice. But uh, basically, Dad said, if I have a choice between letting you do this or quitting, I'll quit. So we quit. <laughs> now, uh, the, the official story is that at the next Commodore board meeting, which was later that month in New York City, is when Dad was fired by the board. Um, as far as I know, Dad did not attend that meeting. So it is physically impossible for that to have happened. <laughs> so that changes. And like you said, you suddenly have the ability to become the vice president of software for a new company. Right. Uh, and that obviously is going to become Atari. Uh, I want to go back just two steps then. Uh, and I know you weren't active at Commodore uh, during the period of the VIC-20 and the C64's launch, but I thought maybe you can shed some light on a couple of issues with those machines before we jump into the Atari aspect, which is actually just as interesting in many ways. So <clears throat> the uh, uh, 6502 is used in the PET and the VIC-20. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. I've got the COVID right now. So I'm I'm on the tail end of it as we speak. I'm, I'm uh, sorry to hear that. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, you're, you're recovering well. I'm recovering very well. It didn't hit me that hard. Uh, thank goodness for vaccines. But uh, still, it's a little bit in the throat at this point still. Uh, sorry. Back. Uh, so the... Moss uh, was very successful with 6502 with the PET, uh, the VIC-20, and a thousand other applications like the uh, Asteroids Arcade Machine and stuff like that. Uh, the 6510, which is the upgrade version for the C64. Uh, do you know if they were working on any kind of 16-bit version of it at the time that uh, your father leaves Commodore? Yes. Was there any development? Okay. Yeah, so... Um so remember, uh, so Chuck had worked, um, on the 6800, um, mm -hmm. at, uh, Motorola. Uh, Motorola's 16 bit version was the 68000. So six, uh, so MOS Technologies version, 16 bit version was the 650000. So they just <laughs> added another zero and kept 65 instead of 68. Um, and there was a whole design and, idea for how to do that so yeah there was there was work in that direction uh, okay. it never went anywhere obviously yeah um but uh yeah there were there were people working on 16-bit architectures gotcha. and um bill mensch who was another one of the main designers of the 6502 along with chuck had a company called the um western design center uh, which still exists and still makes products. Um, a lot of the core technologies for a large number of uh, microprocessors, including the ARM, um, licensed stuff from Western Design Center. Oh, really? Um, so he had a, a machine called the 65816, uh, which was a 16-bit version. Uh, or a 16-bit um, extension of the 6502 that had a, a, a bit flip that would make it completely 6502 compatible, or uh, an extended character, uh, an extended instruction set. Uh, cool. So there were uh, a couple of different 6502-like uh, machines that were uh, that had thoughts in the 16-bit direction. Gotcha. Oh. It would have been interesting to see. Do you know if they had already started any designs for what kind of computer that chip would be used in, or was it purely just the chip level at that point? Um, so the chip level was independent of the computer level. Um, there was a machine uh, being developed at Commodore, um, the Commodore 900, if I remember correctly, uh, which was a Z8000 uh, base machine that was a uh, a Unix knockoff type thing from a company called Mark Williams. 
uh, that was a completely Unix compatible operating system with high resolution monochrome graphics and a, a bunch of other fancy things that um, did eventually make it to market, but never had a, uh, a, a big following. Uh, gotcha. When, when my dad left Commodore, uh, I mean, my, my view is incredibly biased. Uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but as far as I could tell from the outside, it was uh, a headless chicken. Um, it, it just sort of scurried in various directions with, with no clear understanding of what to do. Uh, and a machine like the, uh, uh, the 900 had, had no hope of, uh, of getting anywhere. And I, I think that if you look at what Commodore did in, uh, late 1984 and, Onwards, it was obvious that there was there was no direction. Hmm. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. Despite the fact that well, I I stuck true to Commodore because well, I didn't know who was running it, but I stuck true to Commodore after the C sixty four and didn't move on to the Amiga. But it was uh, yeah, it was uh, it, it was kind of sad just to see that there was no new product coming out. There was no innovation or, or anything. Yeah. The the Amiga, uh, the interplay between the Amiga and the Atari ST, uh, is just fascinating. Uh, those two machines are as different as two machines that come out simultaneously as they could possibly be. Uh, yeah, really, really quite fascinating. Uh, the people that designed the Amiga are the people that designed the Atari 8-bit machines. Mm-hmm. And the people that designed the uh, Atari 16-bit machines were the people in charge of the uh, uh, production and, and continued development of the uh, Commodore 64. So it, re- really quite interesting. It, it it was especially when you consider Commodore just seemed to have abandoned the basic principle of, as your father would say, computers uh, for the masses, not the classes. Right. With the Amiga being the original Amiga being an extremely expensive piece of kit, and the Atari ST being an extremely uh, I, I don't I don't want to call it cheap. That's the wrong adjective. But uh, an extremely affordable option. Uh, yeah, with 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 fairly similar capabilities. Um, there was an awful lot of very fancy hardware built into the Amiga that allowed it to do some pretty amazing things that almost no one used and very few people cared about. Um, so the Amiga was in many ways the last machine that was hand optimized at the chip level. Yeah. And, um, the ST was the first machine that was done as a gate array. Um, there was no customization in those chips at all. Uh, I remember talking to one of the designers and he, you know, did in the high level description language, the hardware, made sure everything worked, then pushed the button to, uh, have it transferred into the gate array and then started the process of optimizing. And he went, wait, before I optimize, let me see how much I have to save. And he looked and went, Oh, nothing. Um, the limit, the, uh, there were two things that decided the size of a chip in this, uh, setup. One was the number of pins, uh, determines just by the, the sheer size around the, the die. You, in order to fit that many pins, you need to have a die at least that big and a pin and a, uh, chip that couldn't be made smaller because it was, limited by the number of pads, was called a pad-limited chip. Um, and if the uh, the inner logic was bigger than it needed to be, uh, bigger than it would fit within that pad, then it was 
uh, could be optimized and shrunk down to the point where it was pad limited. Um, his design was pad limited at the beginning. So there was no optimization required. Uh, and it wouldn't have helped anyway. <laughs> Uh, and I, I know we're jumping around a little bit, but since we're on the topic, the Atari ST does get developed again, six months, similar to the, uh, turnaround time on the pet and the much, much larger group, much larger group. Uh, how yeah. many people work on it approximately? Um, so there were five or six people in the hardware and almost a dozen in the software. Okay. Now what, how Which, many you know, of these them, days is a tiny group, but of course. Yeah. Yeah. How many how many of them are Commodore alum? Six. Okay. Uh, and mostly that, the hardware side. Most of the hardware side. Now the I don't want to get too deep into the software side of it because uh I do want to I got to put a pin in that and go back just really briefly uh, back to Commodore. Okay. So uh, one of the differences that seemed to exist between what Apple was doing and what Commodore was doing during this period, uh, during that period, uh, Commodore brings out the VIC 20. Then it brings out the C64 a year later. Uh, there's very little in what you would call compatibility between the systems. Um, uh, uh, because of the different resolutions, different number of characters, different color palettes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, but Apple keeps doing revisions of the Apple II, adding a little feature here, a little feature there, and so forth. Was there ever a consideration while your father was still at Commodore of that kind of iterative development on the C64 as a platform. Not that I know of, but I wouldn't know. Oh, okay. Perfectly valid. Uh, and there was some, I mean, the reputation, the popular conceit was that your father was very reluctant to do marketing, at least big scale marketing. For the computer. He didn't believe marketing was a thing. Okay. Um, he had no idea why the word existed. Um, he, when he heard marketing, he just thought it was a fancy word for advertising. Okay. Uh, the idea that you would ask the market what was required in something as groundbreaking as computers where the market, frankly, didn't have the vaguest clue what was possible, um, was ridiculous. Um, marketing um, makes no sense in a technological business from his point of view. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, and I guess that begs the question of how deep was his understanding of the potential uses and of the machines that he was selling as shallow as they could be. He knew that they manipulated information and that information is important and that the, it was clear that the world was going to a place where being able to manipulate information was going to be vital. And he, especially later, could see the effect of information um, spread on the area behind the Iron Curtain and was incredibly pleased with the VIC-20 and Commodore 64's effect on the Eastern Bloc because so much communication happened, um, which was at least important if not pivotal in its destruction um but he never programmed anything he was never comfortable using a computer um until i think the first machine he had any personal comfort with was an ipad oh really yeah interesting um, yeah he he never learned to type 
uh, and had no no understanding of how they worked. Wow. Uh, and so, but he's but he at least understood the potential of it, which I, I think is at a very very high level. Um, yeah. It. I am. When I think back on it, I'm astounded that with as little detail available to him, he was able to glean the importance. Um, yeah, his, his mind worked very differently than mine did. Um, but clearly an incredibly brilliant person. Definitely, definitely, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, and I guess one more question about Commodore before we move on to Atari. Uh, uh, the original founding of Commodore is your father and a man named Manfred Cap. Uh huh. And I wanted to know, did you ever meet Mr. Cap? Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, what happened? How did he leave the company? Do you know? Don't know. Okay. Okay. That, that was, that was not decided. It, however it happened, it was personally painful to my father. Oh. Okay. Uh, he was he was not happy that it that it ended, um, but it was it was necessary for some reason, and I don't know why. Okay, yeah, because I, I haven't been able to track down why, and I thought, well, maybe, but okay. Uh, so moving on then to what will become Atari. So you're graduating. Your father has just left Commodore, right? And uh. Was it always your father's intention to stay in the industry when he leaves Commodore? No. So when he left Commodore, he just needed to relax. Um, so he quit and um, decided, okay, I'm going to sell my Commodore stock. Uh, I'm going to have a bunch of money. Uh, and... I owe a bunch of people around the world thanks for this because they were my international partners. So he did a round the world trip where he would visit distributors and suppliers, um, all over the place just to, to thank them and to relax. And at some point on the trip, a uh, set of merchant bankers contacted him and said, Warner Communication is going to be driven bankrupt if they don't get rid of Atari. Atari was losing $2 million a working day. Wow. Um, not spending, but losing. And if we don't get rid of this company, um, it's going under. So they were given the, uh, the task of, of selling uh, Atari and they contacted dad and said, do you want it? And, uh, after he got back from his trip, uh, the, the negotiations started in detail. Uh, I graduate. So graduation, I was done with my PhD in May of 84. I went to Europe for a month for a honeymoon uh, the negotiations were still underway. Uh, the day, day or two before I was scheduled to come back home, I called up, spoke to my older brother. He said, stay for another month. These people are crazy. We're never going to have a deal. Uh, get home and from my mother-in-law's apartment in New York, call my brother. He said, the deal's done. We own Atari. Come home now. <laughs> uh, so that deal to purchase Atari, uh, obviously it did not include Atari games, which was the arcade division. Right. Uh, what now, obviously you weren't part of those negotiations, but did your father and was it both of your brothers or only Sam who was involved with the negotiations? Mostly Sam. Mostly Sam. Yeah. Gary, Gary was involved <laughs> to some degree. Okay. Uh, how, uh, 
did they truly understand what Atari's assets were going into the purchase? I don't think anyone at Warner truly understood what Atari's assets were (laughs) going into the purchase. Part of the deal was the, um, the value of the assets would be determined by what we could get out of them. Okay. So it wasn't actually known until six months to a year later what the purchase price was. Okay. 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 I gotta, now I, I have to do a double take. So the deal was for the acquisition of the company and pending, but the price was pending a valuation of the assets. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, and, and to a large extent, it was okay. You have to live off of this. Uh, so, uh, dad had to commit a certain amount of, um, capital to get it going, but his intent was to, to use the accounts receivable, um, as funding and to pay as little of the accounts payable as possible or as slowly as possible. Um, to minimize the bleed. Uh, but it was still going at, you know, $2 million a day, uh, when we wow. started. Uh, that ended quickly. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've heard stories from a, a variety of people about the, the massive layoffs, uh, that happened very, very quickly at Atari. Yeah. There uh, were 1,200 people working for Atari in the, um, Silicon Valley area. Within two weeks, it was 200. Wow. Uh, and how, I mean, at that speed, how much thought was actually given to who got to stay and who was leaving? Uh, highly variable. So there okay. was a, I don't remember, it was 200 or 400 person international sales and marketing group um, supporting $5 million a year business. Which is insane. So they were all fired. I mean, just all of them. Lock, stock, and barrel. Um, on the other hand, there was a group of, I think, 60 games programmers. And we were allowed to keep, I think it was 10. I don't remember exactly. Um, and John Fagans and I went to interview them all. Uh, when we arrived at the building... We're walking through the lobby and one of the programmers knew who we were and knew what we were there for. So this was the mid 1980s and there was a button you could push on your phone that would give you a company wide page. Um, and he said, the stormtroopers have arrived oh. as we walked in. Um, he, we wound up keeping him. I didn't know who it was. Um, and many years later, he apologized profusely because he had no idea my parents were Holocaust survivors. Mm. Um, and calling us stormtroopers did not feel right. Uh, but uh, he was a great guy, so I, I, uh, I, I have no problem with it. Do you happen uh, to remember who it was? I do, but I, I'm not. Oh, okay. Say. Not a problem. Not a problem. <laughs> great guy, uh, still in touch occasionally. Friends on Facebook. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Now, uh, and this, I guess this is the part where, uh, we need to talk a little bit about your position, this title of vice president of software. Okay. Uh, so what was the original concept behind it? And, uh, why, uh, what, what was your understanding of that position when you accepted it? So my father didn't give a rat's ass about titles. Um, so it had no meaning. Uh, my brother, who was president, um, said that, and this was a few years later, when the term became state of the art, I was the CTO. Hmm. But that concept didn't exist. I couldn't be the hardware guy because there was already someone doing that, Shiraz Shivji. So 
computers are hardware and software. Shiraz is hardware. I'm software. Um, and my responsibility was to do whatever I could um, to take care of problems, whatever they were. Gotcha. Okay, sounds straightforward enough. <laughs> A bit chaotic, but straightforward enough. Yeah. Now, and you just mentioned it, you were walking into the programmer's den with a Moss Technology uh, alum. And so my question is before well, so the – John, So John never worked for Moss Technology. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, John, John worked for Commodore. Ah, okay. um, so John was hired straight out of – so John um, had gotten a degree in computer science um, in the Midwest and was on his way to work for um, – I don't remember if it was Control Data or IBM. And he literally had all of this stuff in a, um, in a U-Haul and was going to drive it up. And Chuck said, just come out for the weekend and we'll talk. And he was there for three weeks and wound up going back to Iowa, um, driving his van out and stayed in California for decades. Awesome. <laughs> Probably got a copy of a Heinlein book on the way. <laughs> well, he, he got the copy uh, the first night he was in California. Gotcha. Now, uh, so – before you guys officially and and when I refer to you guys, I'm talking about your father and your brothers and you. I hope that's okay to be referring to it that way. Uh, okay. Uh, so when you get, uh, when you guys take over Atari uh, or acquire Atari is probably the better uh, uh, phrase. Was there already communication with any of the Commodore staff uh, that you thought would be helpful at Atari? Were those relationships already worked out? Who might be coming along? Well, remember, when Dad left Commodore, he had no idea that the Atari thing was possible. Hmm. He decided after doing his worldwide tour that he wanted to stay busy. And knew that computers were going to get more important. Um, saw this Macintosh thing and went, okay, this makes computers more useful. So he started another company called Tremel Technology Limited. He really got a tickle from the fact that the abbreviation was TTL because <laughs> all of the chips were TTL. Um, in order to avoid the... Um, mispronunciation problem. Tremel was spelled incorrectly. It was tre- it was spelled without the I, so that people would not be tempted to pronounce it Tremel. So instead, they pronounced it Tremel. Um, so <laughs> it, it it avoided that mispronunciation problem and produced a different mispronunciation problem. But um, Tremel Technology (TTL) had half a dozen people working for it designing what became the ST before the Atari deal was done. Oh, okay, okay. That I didn't uh, – okay, then I misunderstood the, the timeline. So basically those those people – I'm guessing all of them or almost all of them had come from Commodore, correct? Yes, all of them had come from Commodore. Okay, so the intention to get back into the computer business – was already set. Uh, I have to ask, do you know whether or not your father, during his world trip, because uh, I know that several of the international sales force for Atari had been previously part of the international sales force for Commodore. I believe uh, Germany, France, and a few other uh, key, uh, um, uh, key representatives had previously worked for Commodore while your father think- was there. Of, I think there was some overlap in Germany, more in England, mm. um, some in France, but uh, no, it was not at all clear. No, it, that okay. 
So all of that stuff, the, the business, not the technology, that all happened after taking over um, Atari. Atari. Okay, gotcha. Um, okay, so so how far along was uh, what would become the ST? How far along was that process when the Atari uh, idea or the option of acquiring Atari comes about? Um, basic design from the what will the capabilities be? Uh, basic um, specification and narrowing down what the processor would be. Okay. Uh, so we knew it was a 68,000. We knew it was going to be a full graphics machine. Uh, the idea was it would be a Windows pointer icon mouse thing. Um, but that was about it. Uh, the basic hardware was being worked on, uh, in parallel with the Atari negotiations. Uh, but, and again, I wasn't there. Um, I've spoken to, you know, about this to the people that were, and they said mostly the Atari stuff was a hell of a distraction. Um, but they tried to ignore it to the extent that they could. Okay. And by a distraction, uh, you mean just from the administrative side or did that also have any spillover into the, uh, the technical staff that was working on uh, the, there design? was no, there, there was no Atari technical staff involved. It was just, it would be okay. If we take this over, how much of what we're doing is going to have to change because of new equipment, new tools, new requirements. Uh, you know, they, they just didn't know what was going to happen. A huge unknown. Um, and the fact is very little change. Um, the office space got bigger. That was about it. And there was, you know, more secretaries because there were sub. <laughs> um, but dad was absolutely adamant that the ST group be as completely isolated from the rest of the company as possible. Let them make their machine and they will just simply use from Atari what they needed, but anything else that they were doing continues. We're going to take a pause right there, dear listeners, and come back next time when we continue our conversation with Leonard Trammell and find out how the Atari ST was launched onto the market, the role the Panther and the Jaguar played in Atari, and so, so, so much more. Until then, have fun. I hope you've enjoyed another Video Game Newsroom Time Machine interview. You can leave us comments on Twitter, Instagram, and if you like what we're doing here, drop us a couple of bucks on Patreon. All the links are in the description below.